Well, good morning, Highview Church. It's good to see everyone this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And while you're turning, let me welcome all of our guests here this morning. We're so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us today. Uh, I'd love to meet you before you leave. Uh, if you would, fill out one of those connect cards that Pastor Tyler mentioned earlier. And then come down uh, here to the front of the stage. I'll be uh, hanging out here following today's service. Our text is Luke 16. We're going to cover, Lord willing, 16 through 31. I'm going to read, however, only 19, 20, 21, and 22. And then we're going to dive right in. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, what we know not, oh, teach us now. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, kindly make us for your son's sake. Amen. Sometimes the easiest way to make something worse is try to fix it. I recently came across an example of this particular phenomenon in a book written by an Old Testament scholar on some of the more difficult texts in the scriptures, particularly in some of the opening books of the Old Testament. And he told the story of a neighbor he had who had wanted to remove a grease stain from his garage floor. And he figured since gasoline dissolves grease, he would pour some gasoline on the concrete floor, scrub it with a wire brush, and that would remove the stain. And here's the thing, it worked. The stain came off. He fixed the problem. He turned off the lights, he shut the garage door, and he went to bed. But inside the closed up garage, there was a lit pilot light on his hot water heater. Once the garage filled with fumes, kaboom. The garage essentially became a large bomb adjacent to his home. His house was burned to the ground. Now, what point was the author trying to make prove or, or push forward in this particular story? He writes this. The story reminds us, quote, to be wary of solutions that to easily resolve all difficulties. We may rid ourselves of one problem only to find ourselves stuck with far more destru destructive consequences than we had anticipated, end quote. This is also true of difficult passages in the Bible. While we may not always be comfortable with passages about judgment or wrath or hell, attempting to remove them creates far deeper problems that you're not envisioning. Today we come to a passage that many would like to scrub right out of the New Testament. It features teaching on the law, a sensitive matter like divorce, and the story of a rich man and a poor man whose name was Lazarus. Here's how we're gonna break this sermon up, two parts. Part one, law. Part two, Lazarus and life after death. So let's get right to work. Look with me at Luke chapter 16, verse 16. The passage begins with, the law and the prophets, Jesus says, were until John. John. 
Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. Now, for those of you who've been following along in our verse-by-verse study in the Gospel of Luke, you know that this verse follows Jesus' often puzzling parable on the shrewd steward found in verses 1 through verse 15. Uh, For the sake of time, I will not review that passage today. But for those of you who missed last week's sermon, I highly recommend going online to listen to Pastor Kyle's excellent exposition of that parable. That parable ends, if you recall, with Jesus condemning the scribes and Pharisees for their love of money. Their idolatry evident in their attempt to serve two masters, God and mammon, and you cannot serve two masters. Now, it's important here to take a deep breath as we go through these teachings of Jesus to say this. It was preaching like this that would soon get Jesus killed. These men believe that they are exceedingly righteous. These Pharisees see themselves as keepers of the entirety of the law and prophets. And in this sweeping word of judgment, Jesus says, you are guilty of breaking the first commandment. Exodus 20 verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. They had broken the first commandment while also patting themselves on the back for fulfilling even the finer points of the law. And with their failure to keep the first commandment, that meant they were also guilty of breaking the entire first table of the Ten Commandments. And at the end of the day, that meant breaking all of the law. They had failed to keep the greatest commandment, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul, mind, and strength. Understanding what Jesus is doing here is critical if we're gonna understand the structure of this chapter. And the the actual structure of the chapter is itself instructive. Remember, this chapter is a continuation of a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees from previous chapters. It is only continuing to intensify here. On the surface, the section we're gonna cover today feels very disjointed. And when you look at it from the perspective of the entirety of the chapter, including the section that Pastor Kyle preached last week, it seems even more disjointed. A parable followed by a statement about the law and prophets, followed by a statement on divorce of all things, followed by another parable. But when we pull up to the 30,000 foot level and we look at this entire chapter, what we see is this, that this short section of the law, beginning in verse 16, is actually a hinge on which the entire chapter swings connecting as as a sort of connective tissue, if you will, the parable we looked at last week and the parable that will conclude this chapter this week. It is this connecting tissue that we now turn. That leads us to part one, law. Do you remember how the Pharisees responded to Jesus' charge that they had broken the first commandment? Look at verse 14 and 15. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Jesus tells them and all of us that any attempts to justify ourselves externally is ultimately pointless, since God knows the condition of our souls internally. But Jesus isn't done with these guys. He continues in verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. That phrase, law and prophets, very frequently used in your New Testament as a way of summarizing the Old Testament. 
Specifically here, Jesus uses it to define an epoch of history prior to his arrival where the Old Testament serves as a preparatory and anticipatory role in pointing us forward to Christ. Now here's why that matters. It means that Jesus understood the Old Testament as Christian scripture. I wouldn't recommend unhitching myself from that. Anyone who does stands in direct opposition to Jesus and his view of the Old Testament. Now, of course, we cannot remove the Old Testament from its religious and historical context, but before the Old Testament is anything else, it is a book that tells us of the Christ who was to come and who we know now has come. That's exactly how Jesus and the And later, the apostles read and taught the Old Testament. In the words of one scholar, quote, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms map out and clarify the meaning of the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The law and the prophets are the foundation of Christian preaching of the gospel. Amen. And Jesus, interestingly here, includes John the Baptist, I don't know if you caught this, as an Old Testament prophet. Verse 16 says, the law and the prophets were until John. Jesus says that John the Baptist was both the final Old Testament prophet and the first New Testament prophet. He has one foot firmly planted in each age. He's a transition figure. Now, why is that significant? Specifically, we should ask, why is Jesus mentioning John's role here as an Old Testament prophet? For this simple reason. The Pharisees, some listening to Jesus as he preached this, had heard John's message of repentance and rejected it. They had refused to repent and be baptized, as John had called them to do. And Jesus wants them to know you didn't reject some random guy preaching in the wilderness. No, when you rejected John and his message, you rejected the law and prophets. David Garland commenting on this this particular passage, he writes that, quote, unlike those that submitted to John's baptism of repentance, the Pharisees, by contrast, are singled out here for rejecting God's purpose for themselves by refusing to repent and be baptized. The Pharisees' love of money then would be a primary reason why they turned a deaf ear to John's call to repent and why they brush off the new period of salvation history that his preaching begun. End quote. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, Jesus says, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. That phrase, everyone forces his way into it, is a really, really interesting phrase. Now, can people by their own force of will force their way into the kingdom of God? No, this is a place where our English translations just do not serve the original Greek very well. Luke uses here an intensive form of this verb in question. A better translation would be, and every person is insistently urged to enter the kingdom of God. That fits with Jesus' urgent call to repent that we have seen as he proclaims the kingdom's arrival. And then he says this in verse 17, but it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. A couple things we see here. For starters, Jesus is emphasizing the enduring authority and perfection of God's law. Reinforcing that not even the smallest aspect, exclamation point, period, whatever you want to add as the smallest way to modify anything will pass away. But Jesus fulfilled the law, right? So what does this mean for Christians living on this side of the cross 
where the demands of the law have been satisfied in Christ. Well, here I hold to the reformers' threefold use of the law. The reformers taught that the law remains a mirror revealing our sin and need for Christ, a restraint on evil in society, and then a guide for Christian living. The law remains a mirror revealing our sin and need for Christ, a restraint on evil in society, and a guide for Christian living. Think of it this way, if you have a to-do list, when you complete that item, you check it off or you scratch through it. You do not erase it from the list. Instinctively, you don't do that. Some of you may, you're a weirdo, but that's just weird, but here's why. Because in some ways, that item's fulfillment shapes what you do next. Completion doesn't make something irrelevant at all. An example, the Old Testament sacrificial system is complete. Go try to fulfill the Old Testament sacrificial system this morning. You'll need a temple. Oh, wait, there hasn't been one for, you guessed it, 2,000 years. Christ was the perfect and final sacrifice for sin. And every saved person in here should say, hallelujah, right? Yeah, that's really good news. There are no altars in the New Testament. But that doesn't mean studying the sacrificial system of the Old Testament has no value for Christians. It teaches us, among other things, that the cost of sin is death. It points us forward to a time when according to Hebrews 9 verse 10, Christ entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of goats and calves and their blood, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. That's all Old Testament language, folks. All of it. Christ's fulfillment of the law does not abolish its purpose. No, it establishes it and affirms it. But what makes this interesting is that Jesus is saying this to a group of people who don't need to be told that. He's talking to a group of Pharisees and scribes. All of them believed in the eternal authority and perfection of God's word in the law and the prophets. I mean, Christians may struggle with what to do with the law and the prophets in light of grace, but the Pharisees did not. Why does Jesus say this to them? Well, he has reminded them of a very important fact about the law and the prophets. That they present an all or nothing proposition for those who claim to be righteous by them. Jesus is about to make this very personal. Look at verse 18. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, here's a classic case of context is king. This verse is not meant to serve as a comprehensive teaching on divorce. This verse actually is often lifted out of its context to beat up on people who've been divorced. In its proper context, the verse, before it is anything else, is a personal indictment of the Pharisees' violation of the law through their unlawful and regular practice of divorce. It's a personal indictment. Now, a bit of background. By the time of Jesus, Jewish views on marriage were at an all-time low. And divorce in that culture worked quite a bit differently from how it works in our culture. In our culture, the husband or the wife can initiate divorce proceedings for basically any reason at all. In that culture, however, it was the sole prerogative of the man. In other words, the woman had no recourse whatsoever. It was the man who had total authority to end the marriage through a ticket of divorce. Divorce. 
And the Pharisees and their boys, the rabbis, had made it really easy for a man to divorce his wife for the most trivial reasons. One well-known rabbi at that time taught that a man could divorce his wife for, quote, spoiling dinner. Another man, a rabbi named Akaba, permitted divorce, quote, if the man found a woman prettier than his wife. The wife, however, as I mentioned, well, divorce was simply not an option for any circumstance that could be presented. One commentator points out that, quote, no right of divorce was granted to the woman by the Pharisees, even if she was unjustly or cruelly treated. This would have included abandonment, physical abuse, or even sexual abuse. Here's the point. Jesus mentions divorce here to hit these hypocrites where it hurts. He is saying, here's one critical way you are not keeping the law and the prophets. He, knowing their hearts, knowing their evil deeds, is exposing that quiet divorce given to that abandoned or abused wife And he's then saying to these men, I know what you've done. See how context changes everything. Now before you get on your high horse towards the Pharisees, let me say this. There is a broader principle in this teaching that applies to all of us. Listen to me really carefully. Where there is a low view of God's word, there will always be a low view of marriage. They go hand in hand. And oftentimes the way we try to deal with the divorce issue is dealing with the divorce issue. We need to talk about the marriage issue. The low view of marriage. Jesus is telling these Pharisees and all of us living in cultures that see this kind of for any reason divorce is no big deal that we are living in opposition to God's word. That attitude stands in direct opposition to God's word. I told you there's passages in the Bible people wish they could erase from their Bibles. Here's one many wish they could do away with. After all, God wants me to be happy, right? No. No. He wants something more for you. He wants you to be holy. And holy people are happy people. (laughs) Why? Because holy people are not happy because of circumstances. Happy, holy people are happy in Christ. Read the verse again. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. He who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, anytime we talk about divorce as Christians, we need to make sure we speak with clarity, conviction, and compassion. Some of you will be more prone to ditch one of those than the other. Some will depend on how you're raised. Some will depend on your personal experience with this issue. Some of it will you know, be kind of personality-based. But we need clarity about what the Bible teaches conviction to stand on that and compassion for fellow sinners living in a world that just does not work the way it was intended to. The Bible is really clear. Marriage is a lifelong covenant between one man and one woman. That is God's design. There are two conditions where divorce is permitted in the New Testament. Adultery, Matthew 19, verse 9, and abandonment in 1 Corinthians 7. Abandonment or desertion, that's a term used to describe, as one scholar put, failing to look after the physical well-being of a spouse. Based on the use of that word culturally, I feel like this would include things like physical or sexual abuse. And in our culture, being divorced by your spouse against your will, which is possible for both parties in our society. But don't miss this. The reason divorce was so easy for these Pharisees is because of their low view of marriage and God's word. High view. Let me say this pastorally for a moment. As a body, we need to collectively raise our view of marriage to match our view of the gospel. 
watching marriages fall apart and divorce seen as a trivial matter when things get tough in a marriage does not portray the gospel of Jesus Christ and his marriage to his bride, the church, to a watching world. Church, we cannot have a high view of the gospel and a low view of the very institution that puts its beauty on display. We need biblical clarity and conviction on this, and we also need compassion. So let me say this. For those of you who are true followers of Jesus this morning, who've experienced divorce, know this. God's grace is sufficient for you. It is not the unpardonable sin. Divorce, while tragic, does not mean you are now cursed and cut off from God. Let me encourage you to use this as an opportunity to disciple others. Invest in troubled marriages. Help others see the pain and damage divorce often brings, not just to the couple, but to everyone around them. Push Christian marriages towards healing and reconciliation, not merely for their joy, but for Christ's glory. So Jesus here highlights the Pharisees' inability to keep the law by highlighting this glaring area of sin in their lives. And then he tells a story about a man with a really well-known name. And that leads us to part two, Lazarus and life after death. Now, before we dive into the story, a couple important points to make that will keep us from missing the point Jesus is making here entirely. For starters, this is a parable and Jesus uses parables to teach us spiritual truths, usually through the use of metaphors. The story is rich in symbolism. And I told you, it's gonna feel very disconnected initially from what we just covered. But remember, this is Jesus' teaching here. It is a made up story. So in some ways, overanalyzing the details and trying to solve it like a puzzle will actually lead you further and further away from the point Jesus is making. Again, context is everything. The story begins by introducing us to the first main character in the story, a rich man. Verse 19, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. The rich man was clothed in purple. This was, of course, a sign of wealth in the ancient world. In Acts 16, you'll remember Lydia, my daughter's favorite Bible character, the maker of purple, who is of course a wealthy entrepreneur. She was also, interestingly enough, the first Christian convert on the European continent. The clothes he wore were very expensive, but they were also comfortable. They were made of fine linen, probably from Egypt. But the man's extravagance went beyond his own clothing and level of comfort in which he lived. He also feasted every day. Essentially, this is telling us that his entire life was a nonstop gluttonous party or, in modern American terms, an average day for us, okay? <laughs> Like, he went to Chick-fil-A three times that day, kind of thing. <laughs> Verse 20 says that he lived this lifestyle of wearing nice clothes and eating nice food behind a large gate. That's a really interesting word in the Greek. The idea of being communicated there is one of almost royalty. This man was behind this very impressive, impenetrable gate that separated him from the world outside. And that gate here represents something more than just mere protection. It represents selective isolation. One of the things about wealth is for the wealthy, it brings privacy. You can isolate yourself on demand. an ability to separate from the world, to be alone. And this rich man was alone. But outside his very impressive gate, we find the second main character of the story. 
Verse 20 says, at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus. It's covered with sores. Who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. This man's life stood in sharp contrast to the rich. One man was rich, one man is poor in the story. The rich man is covered in comfortable clothing. This man is covered in painful sores. One man eats like a king every single day. This man would settle for crumbs that fell from his table. That word crumbs there, it's an interesting word. It refers to pieces of stale bread that wealthy dinner guests would use to clean their hands, and then those pieces of stale bread were then discarded to the animals. But there's a clue here that's really important. Because in a very critical way, this poor man named Lazarus is blessed in ways that the rich man is not. The clue is this. Jesus gives the poor man in the story something that the rich man does not have, a name. His name was Lazarus. Now this is not the other Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, Jesus raised from the dead. But it's interesting that the only person in any of Jesus' parables that gets a name is Lazarus. So the name must be significant, and of course it it is. Lazarus is the Greek translation of the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means God has helped. Eleazar can also be translated as one whom God has blessed or shown favor to. I'm sorry, what? I mean, you read that and you think, what? This guy is physically unable to move himself. He was laid at the gate, probably by some friends that were hoping, hey, maybe laying him here, someone with resources can help him. He's starving to death. He's covered in painful sores. He's accompanied only by unclean wild dogs. Nothing about that screams to me, blessed and highly favored. Nothing. But Jesus is teaching us something here. And it's actually really profound. We often heap pity on those whom God has heaped favor. We call cursed that which God has called blessed. Jesus is the one who pronounces him the one God has helped. It's true. Listen, this man does not have a palatial estate. He doesn't own expensive clothing. He does not eat expensive meals. He enjoys no privacy whatsoever. From a worldly perspective, he has nothing but, but God calls him blessed. How easy is it to look at people who enjoy so much in this life and immediately prescribe blessedness to them? We ask questions of God like, why do you bless these people who are like this? They're blessed, but are they really There's so many good people who have one terrible thing after another happen to them, and then these monsters, they're blessed. But again, are they really? Well, it depends on who is prescribing blessing. We ask these questions why this person, this terrible person morally is receiving all of this material wealth and so on and so forth, only because we mistakenly equate riches with blessing and the Bible does not do that. It's far more nuanced than that. Riches are not inherently evil. 
Many of the godliest people in the Bible were very wealthy men. But it is also true that material wealth is sometimes used by God as an instrument of judgment. Thomas Brooks, one of my favorite Puritan writers, he said this, God sometimes gives men riches in anger, which they abuse to their own ruin. He goes on, many have been cast down by their prosperity and have gone to hell in silver slippers. End quote. The two men lived in completely different worlds, only separated by this impenetrable gate. But then something happens that changes everything. In verse 22, death comes for them both. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Death is the great equalizer, isn't it? Rich, poor, young, old, saved, lost, both the poor man and the rich man had a fixed amount of time to live. As wealthy as this rich man was, he could not buy one moment of life for himself. The man would have perhaps said something similar to the famous American business tycoon Cornelius Van Vanderbilt, who said before he died, as he pondered what good his riches would do him in the face of death, famously said, quote, I am not fit to die and I am afraid to go to hell. Worth what today would be about $4 billion on his deathbed. One famous, <clears throat> one famous pastor pointed out that one of the tragedies of this rich man's life is that nothing else is said about him except that he was rich. His obituary could have been three words, he was rich. How sad. What a wasted life. And the story takes a surprising turn after Lazarus and the rich man die. Lazarus, if you notice the language difference here, is carried by angels to Abraham's side. There's an ascent here. He, he, he is carried to this place that's represented as heaven here, Abraham's side, a place where the people of God, represented here by Abraham, go to be with the Lord. The rich man, on the other hand, is also buried, the text says. Now the words imply ascent, Lazarus goes up, rich man goes down, ascent, descent. In other words, after death, these men go in two very different directions. They wind up in two different places. The rich man, we find out, winds up in hell. And in Hades, a term frequently used in both Testaments to refer to hell, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Now at this point in the story, we have to stop and ask a pivotal question. Why did the rich man go to hell? Is Jesus teaching some kind of class warfare here? So to be poor is to be good, to be rich is to be evil? No, that misses the point entirely. Lazarus doesn't wind up in heaven because he was good. He wound up in heaven because as we've already seen, he was a recipient of God's grace. No one goes to heaven because they're good enough. Everyone in heaven this morning is only in heaven because Christ is good enough. And only those who have experienced the grace of God and the person of Christ are saved from the rich man's fate. It's important to point out there's actually nothing in the story particularly evil about this rich man. He apparently acquired his wealth lawfully. He was probably very respected in his community. He was admired by many. We're not told he was an adulterer or a drunk. He's a decent enough man, actually. A nice man, maybe. But there's lots of nice people in hell this morning. C.S. Lewis talks about sharing the gospel with a group of wealthy business owners. 
And he describes them with their manicured hands, he says, and their nice white collars and beautiful cufflinks. And he refers to them this way, nice men lost in their niceness. So why is the rich man in hell? Well, remember the discussion about law and prophets? I said it's going to feel very disjointed from the story that follows it. In the parable of the shrewd manager, Jesus warns about failing to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But in this story, the rich man is guilty of violating the commandment that is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Each and every day, this good, wealthy, nice man walked past Lazarus as he suffered and slowly died. And in doing so, revealed himself to be a rejecter of the law and the prophets. And that's the connection between all the law and prophet stuff, even the stuff on divorce and this story. Those that reject the law and the prophets, those who do not repent and believe in Christ will face eternal torment and judgment in hell. I told you this is a passage many wish they could simply wipe away from the pages of scripture. But here's the truth. If you try to fix the Bible by erasing hell, you will have to erase Jesus too. After all, he spoke more about hell than heaven. I firmly believe that those who are too nice to mention hell in this age will be seen as hateful monsters in the age to come. In hell, the rich man finally gets what he was after in his life. He is alone. Completely and totally alone. I heard a famous celebrity once comment that he would rather go to hell than heaven. Why? Because all of his friends would be there. How foolish. Since in hell, you are all alone. When the Bible speaks of hell, it speaks about being a place of total isolation, yet receiving God's wrath. No demons with pitchforks and all this nonsense. The rich man cries out to Abraham from hell, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Verse 24, send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. This verse poses some interesting questions. Can people in hell see into heaven? I don't think so. I think Jesus is using a metaphor here to tell a story. Abraham, or the the rich man in hell, cries out for mercy from the heat, and he begs for just a drop of water. It's a terrifying place. And Jesus uses terrifying language to describe it. The time for crying and the time for mercy is gone. The sentence is rendered. That's what Abraham tells the man. But Abraham said, child, remember remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. You see, they're separated again. In their life on earth, they were separated by a very impressive gate. Here, it's an impossible to cross chasm. He says that in order for those who would pass from here to there, you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. But the rich man still doesn't get it. He sees himself as superior to Lazarus. He tells Abraham, hey, get Lazarus to run one final errand for me. Verse 27 And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Again, he's a decent enough guy. 
He desperately wants to warn his five brothers about the horrors of hell that he is enduring. Listen to Abraham's response in verse 29. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Do you see the teaching genius of Jesus here? Do you get what he's saying? He is telling the Pharisees, this rich man is just like you, a rejecter of the law and prophets. But the rich man here in hell, he does not still believe in the power of God's holy word. He objects to Abraham's insistence that the scriptures were enough. He thinks the word needs an additional sign to accompany it if his brothers were ever gonna believe. Verse 30, he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. One commentator adds, the rich man knew his brothers well enough to know they did not believe the Bible any more than he did. Abraham's response ends the story very abruptly. Verse 31, he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And that's how the story ends. And as we sit here this morning, someone has been raised from the dead. He appeared to over 500 people in his resurrected body prior to his ascension. To the right hand of the Father, from where he still lives, ruling and reigning until he returns in power and glory to judge the living and the dead. And that person is Jesus. Don't miss what Abraham was saying to the rich man. If you do not believe God's word, you will never believe anything else God does either including something as impressive as raising his own son from the dead. You see, the story ends abruptly and it leaves us here wanting us to ask and answer this final question. Do we believe what God's word has said about the resurrected Christ? Do you? Lord, I can't change hearts. Holy Spirit, only you can do that through the power of the word preached. And so now, Lord, would you move in this room sparing sinners from the fate of the rich man? May they trust only in you and your finished work, O Christ. We ask this in your holy and precious name. All God's people said,